we are moving into the interest of size and new species regarding the deep sea fishers, fish, uh, together with the research associate Jan Ude Polsen. Were they correct? Yeah. Uh, so stay tuned and uh, listen to sharks. Welcome, Jan. Okay, is this on? Yeah. So thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, fish-based symposium. Actually, I had the best introduction I could have asked for this morning with these three talks. You had uh, Monty going through this kind of general review uh, of uh, deep sea fishes. Uh, and he touched on things that I'll also be talking about today. Um, for example, the slick hits, this guy right here. And then you had Alan Jamison talking about Hadel. I won't do that today. Uh, and he, they face a, facing challenges in uh, taxonomy that uh, seems pretty severe. It's also not that bad with this, but it was a great introduction to life in the real deep. Uh, but there's still a lot of life above that depth that we still don't know anything about that. And that's actually what my talk today will be all about. And then finally, Fanny, um, showing visual ecology in the deep sea. It's pretty well known that we will never have a chance to understand uh, the biodiversity in the deep sea if we don't understand the visual ecology because that's how they communicate. And that's probably where a lot of speciation comes from. It's that visual ecology, so it's extremely important. And all of that, it kind of goes into some of the species I'll be talking about today. So, but just a little bit about myself and my work. Probably many of you don't know me, but I've been associated with the Greenland Institute of Resources for many years and been on board fishing <clears throat> the whole southern parts of uh, Greenland for many years. And it's a very interesting area right here uh, because not only do you have very deep slopes that often are very inaccessible to, for example, trawling, You'll also have these southern currents coming up, sometimes with tongues of warm water. So you'll actually have an area right here. It's like a transition zone. And considering how we use um, species distributions, etc., in, for example, uh, studies on climate change, temperature change, it's a very important area because we can actually monitor several things uh, with the species distributions in this area. But the problem is that the fishing efforts uh, are very crude for a long time. So we'll often see fish looking like this. This is uh, an irided anglerfish. And you can see it's completely battered in the trawl. So what we've been doing for over 10 years, trying to run a barcoding project alongside um, regular identification. And it's actually resulted in maybe 50 new records just off Greenland, uh, southern tips mostly just in 10 years, and that shows something about how little we know up there. Um, so my, a lot of my work has gone into this um, kind of thing, especially in deep sea stuff like mctophids, anglerfishes, uh, hatchet fishes. There's been a lot of uh, taxonomic problems and a lot of stuff we don't know. But that's for another time. Um, apart from that, I'm doing a lot of evolutionary relationship study, mostly from molecular. Uh, a lot of mitogenomic work, and I'll get a little bit into that today. So that has been my main uh, focus area, but again, for another time. So I'll be talking about four different studies today, and it's studies that somehow, I think, describe really well what we can expect to find in the deep sea. Pretty much everything is amazing when you get into it, but I think these studies uh, that I've been involved in in the recent few years they show something really nice about what we can expect and how fun taxonomy can be. It is this detective work, and when you're in the middle of it, it's the most interesting thing. Um, and I hope to kind of convey that these studies have really been like, like that. So we have a, a new family. It's this red one, the new Cymatidae and the Leptocephala larvae. And we have these things, they're called mirror bellies. Um, paper published a few years ago. This one was just published. And the two other studies, uh, I hope will be published soon, but not yet. It's one about the tube shoulders. Uh, I'll explain a little bit more about these groups if you don't know them by now. 
But the adults have these amazing photophore patterns all along the ventral side. That's how they communicate, we assume. And then this last one is a giant slick head uh, from Suruga Bay, Japan. Spend a little bit of time on this because it's quite unique uh, in many ways. So these are the four studies that this talk will be evolved around. So to start with the mirror bellies, it's this one. Uh, it belongs to a group that actually, I don't know how many, how many people knew this group before this guy was filled live by the Monterey Bay Aquarium. They have this amazing video. I've seen, uh, probably many of you have seen this uh, online. If you haven't, please do so. It's an amazing fish with the transparent head, uh, the eyes inside, there's the green ones, and then the nostrils out here that actually look like eyes. And they all got these tubular eyes, and this is how this fish looks in the museum. So it really, they're so fragile, and when you work with them, they look like nothing when we uh, see them live. Of course, that's how it is with many, but especially in this group, because they're so fragile. Here's a couple of other representatives. Uh, spookfish and uh, the barrel eyes. And this one, Monacoa grimaldi, it's a mirror belly. And that's the ones I'll be talking about now because we found a couple of new species. There's only about 20 species in this family, so relatively uh, low biodiversity in this family. So what happened was I, was, I had some work I had to do in Tokyo on next generation sequencing, but chance would have it that we didn't get started just before I left. So I had to do something else to do, so I got a batch of uh, these deep sea material coming in from the southwest Pacific. And these are the fishes you see here. That was this one, this one, this one, and this one. And these four, immediately wh when I saw them, you could see there's something strange going on here. Those two doesn't look like this one, and those two doesn't look like that one. And I think before these have never been found before, simply because researchers have not had the material together because it was so obvious, uh, obvious uh, even though I've never worked with these fishes before, but you just knew something was going on. And the real clue to that was actually in this soul right here. These are peculiar fishes in that instead of the body tapering like it usually does in fishes, it's more like expanding into this huge kind of platform uh, making up the belly. So they get this really strange shape. And this down here, it's called the sole. Okay, so there was two specimens of this one, and a juvenile, and then this one. And what it would turn out that preservation is very, very important in this group, because what they did on board, it was a Japanese research vessel. I wasn't on board, but they had preserved the material in alcohol, and they put it in the freezer. And it was a splendid way to preserve uh, these pigments. Sorry down here, which kind of became the key to figuring out that instead of one species, we actually had three. So a little bit about how they work. Here it is. This is the soul. And right here, right at the anus, or just before the anus, the back, back part of the intestine, a huge light organ is present. It's actually very reminiscent of uh, anglerfishes. You know, they have this light organ from the first dorsal fin. The structure of this is very, very similar. So a huge light organ in the back of the intestine, they shoots out light into this big cavity. That's why they have this shape. The cavity is segmented, and they can control uh, the bioluminescence coming out ventrally right here. So when they contract, they kind of close for light coming out, going downwards, and when they expand uh, light, they let loud out, light out via this soul right here. So they must have an amazing control to kind of um, use this bioluminescence, especially considering uh, counter-illumination. This fish must give off a huge silhouette in the water column, but we must assume that it can actually uh, produce bioluminescence and kind of obliterate this uh, big shadow it actually makes. It's a mesopelagic fish. We catch it from maybe 200 down to 700 meters, something like that. So counter-illumination must be a problem for it. Um, just before this study, there was, uh, there was two species, Ophistoproctus solatus and uh, Monacoa grimaldi. <coughs> it's actually two different genera we know now. We did, uh, in order to test this, 
of course, these pigments on this soul. Is it actually something? We did, uh, we did some mitogenomic sequences, and sure enough, it, it checked out. It was a very solid, uh, different, different species. Most noteworthy, this Ophistoproctus soleatus is actually very different molecularly. You would think that a group, this whole group with these very stout, dwarfy, like Ophistoproctus, you would think molecularly they would be uh, kind of more similar also in the molecular department, but that's actually not true. So many things we don't know in this uh, Ophistoproctid family right now. And I just want to mention this, this is one of the best things molecular I've ever worked with, they just work in the lab. I'm just saying this because I'll show you an example later where it didn't work. Uh, and as probably many of you, a lot of students here, you'll probably have some hard times in the lab. I've been there, and, uh, but when you have something that works this well, you really should appreciate it when it's uh, going. Because that mitogenomic work can be really uh, tough sometimes. So what is, this is what we end up with. Um, three species and a juvenile. And these are the pigment patterns. It's actually the only way we can really tell the different species. And we must assume that this is for communication. And the, the patterns are very clear. So this one is called Monocoa niger, because it has this black streak along the whole sole. Uh, and then this one, this is only from the Atlantic, Monocoa grimaldi. It has four spots, too big and too small. And then we have this Monocoa grigio, it's also a new one from the uh, southwest, or from the Pacific. It has kind of two spots. And then the juveniles, and the juveniles are quite interesting. This whole thing in juvenile is, is iridescent. It's so bioluminescent that it's speculation, but maybe the whole soul is actually bioluminescent in the juvenile. They're comical. They have a huge snout that kind of uh, gets smaller the bigger the fish gets. And, the, and this um, light organ, it has in the back of an intestine, it's protruding out of the fish in the juveniles. And there are similar reports from all the literature that this is how all juveniles look like, even though it's uh, the Pacific or the Atlantic. So we must assume that all uh, juveniles look alike in this genus, as far as we can tell, anyway. So that's one example of the Antarctic in deep sea fishes. Another one is the tube shoulder. Uh, I don't know how many of you know this group, but they're quite nice to work with because this is an example of an adult, and they don't vary. About half the species in this family, they have these photophores on the ventral part, and the photophores are like set. They don't change. There's no variation uh, in, within the species. So just wonderful to work with the adults. But the juveniles are a completely different thing. They change the photophore pattern throughout their whole lifespan. So for this particular study, I've identified four uh, excluding the larvae uh, kind of stages that these fish go through, which, which makes taxonomy really a difficult thing to do. I just want to, as an example of the called tube shoulders, because Monty mentioned it, they have this quite unique structure. It's actually a modified scale right behind the head, and they can excrete this green bioluminescent uh, substance uh, of some kind. Um, luciferin, luciferide is some kind of enzyme reaction they use for that. It's not often seen, but I was lucky enough to get a photo of it uh, off Greenland one year, right there. So, what I've been doing, this is Sagamictus snagenbecki, it's a North Atlantic species. And here, are, and here is, it's, this is the juvenile, and here's the adult. It's actually a late juvenile. There's also an early juvenile stage that looks very different. So, a late juvenile and an early adult. And you can kind of see when you try to do the line illustrations, how you would perceive this fish when you're looking at it uh, from below, a predator or whatnot. So the juvenile has these very heavy pigmentations. For example, uh, two big light organs that's never been found before. Uh, and you, uh, you can imagine it would appear very daunting if it kind of flashes these things. It looks much bigger than it is. It's kind of what we assume this is for anti-predation purposes. But also, some really uh, large structures on the belly in these juveniles and changing all into very, very set uh, photophore formations in the adult. And it kind of makes sense uh, from what we think, anti-predation in juveniles turning into more uh, communication-wise in adults 
For example, when reproduction sets in, you will need to be able to communicate and find mates and so forth. But that whole uh, kind of transformation series in tube shoulder fishes is quite extraordinary, and that's also why this is only, it's only the third example of someone trying to kind of figure out uh, the transformation series, how it actually look like. The truth is, when you get a juvenile specimen of, of platytroctids, it's impossible, almost impossible, uh, to tell what species it belongs to. I couldn't. I had to use molecular tools to kind of associate the adult with the, with the juvenile. But just a nice example of how frustrating, but also very interesting, can be. But deep sea fish and larvae and juveniles, it's not, this is not something new. It's pretty much found in all uh, fish groups, I guess, especially in deep sea fishes. The larvae or the juveniles are very different to the adults. So here are the actual photos of the juvenile and adult Sagamictus that I just talked about. You all know the study by David Johnson, where he kind of lumped three families into one, with also some extreme larvae transforming into these whale fish adults. Uh, Ophidi forms, these are pearl fish, have some also extraordinary uh, larval or juvenile forms. So there's nothing new about this. Even the, the one I showed you with this comical big snout in the juvenile in the mirror belly. So, and that brings me to the next uh, topic. It's a new family we just found recently. Um, where also the juveniles are very different, it's the leptocephali of eels. You know those. Um, and they're quite, they're really, really different. But the thing is, it's not that many species of eels we actually know the juvenile stage for as yet. And it all started with this one, we picked it up. It was also from off Greenland, off Tasilag in 2013. And uh, this is uh, Neo Saima, and it's only been reported from 1,500 meters and below before, but it ended up on the deck of a trawl. We were, we were fishing for Greenland halibut. And this is very strange. How would a fish that uh, live below maybe 1,000 meters actually end up on deck? I have no idea what has happened. Um, if it got tangled in the trawl or whatever, but nonetheless, so we have no idea what depth it was actually caught. But I started to, uh, to study this one a little bit. And just to let you know, there's a group of uh, deep sea pelagic eel called the Sacrophoringiformis. It's in quotation mark because it's not, an, it's not a real clade. It's a clade within the Angiliformis, so giving this ordinal status is actually not appropriate. That's another story. But you have these five groups. You have the Neosaima, a red eel. Actually, the first time this was caught, worked by Castle, uh, they thought this was the larvae. But they started to examine it, it had a lot of adult features, but it, because in many ways it kind of looks like a, a Leptocephalus larvae. So they thought it was some kind of neotenic uh, feature in this, in this family, or in this group of fishes. But it's the adult, approximately 16 centimeters, the maximum. Then you have the one jaws, monognathids, kind of rare stuff, uh, also pretty deep, you all know the Yuri Faringidae, some wonderful live video recently came out of this one. And then the Saku Faringidae, and then finally Saima. And it was kind of the five, five groups we were working with in this study. Luckily, one specimen uh, caught by my co-authors in this study uh, in the Sargasso Sea, and it's this one. So it's only known from six adults and this one uh, larvae. So we were able to put, associate them also with some DNA work. And it's a very unique leptocephalus, actually. Very big eye, short jaws, and a rounded body. Uh, but still, how do you define a family? It's pretty subjective, as you know. Uh, it, was, it was been lumped with Saima before this one. So there's actually a family called Saimatidae, consisting of this and this. But all honesty, no characters really associate them. It's more like they're really short compared to all other eels, so they've kind of been lumped in the same family. So we did some mitogenomic work on it, and this was extremely frustrating. But when it actually worked, it turned out really good, because the gene order in this new Saima was the same as in Uropharyngidae and Sacopharyngidae. 
And it also checked out when we analyzed them in a regular DNA uh, phylogeny. But that's actually where we could see the gene order is the same here as these two. And that's a pretty solid character. It doesn't really happen by chance. So we were able to erect this new family and say it has nothing to do with Saima or the monognathus for that matter. And someone mentioned also earlier that uh, where do eels come from? There's been this thing about they come from the deep sea. Yun Inui has done some work on this. And it is kind of what we see, that uh, the regular European eel, for example, they are kind of derived from some kind of pelagic midwater group. Uh, so most analysis tells us that. That's pretty interesting, that they might actually come from deep sea stuff. So mitogenomic gene orders, very, very useful in this particular case. So this is what we end up with, and we were lucky enough to get the larvae for these five new families. And in this group of sacopharyngiform uh, fishes, there are about 30 species, but these are actually the only five uh, known with the larvae as yet. Which brings me to the next one. Um, this is the giant I'm talking about. This was my first group. I started as a master student working with tube shoulders and slick heads. And your first group always become kind of something special to you. And uh, they wrote from Japan at one point some years ago about they caught a fish that was uh, 25 kilos and 140 centimeter long. I have to uh, be honest, I didn't believe him. Uh, because the, the picture was a little bit, or the photo was a bit fussy, and I couldn't really see what was going on. And the biggest one in this family is actually five kilo. We get that off Greenland. The whole family consists of mainly small species, so this is actually also a big one in the slickhead family context. Anyway, went over there and had a look, and sure enough, it checks out. They caught a, they caught a slickhead weighing 25 kilos in Suruga Bay. Uh, I could not believe it. You know, you get these uh, new descriptions of, for example, opus, molas, etc., but they're not really deep sea. This is really a true deep sea fish because they haven't been, they've only been caught from 2,000 to 2,500 meters. And the Suruga Bay uh, is a very interesting place. It goes from, it's like, a, it's kind of an underwater mountain range going up to Mount Fuji, and the trenches just get deeper and deeper. It goes out into the Philippine Sea right here, um, and then further out into the, into the Pacific. So it's very, it's deep, deep trenches kind of coming up, going into Suruga Bay. And if any of you have been to Japan, uh, you know, they fish a lot, and they fish very deep. That's also why going to a fish market in Asia or in Japan is a wonderful thing, because you can, you can find uh, a, a lot of stuff. I've done, it a lot, uh, I've done that a lot in Skiti, for example. But you also know they fish deep, so it's quite amazing that one of the heavily, most heavily fished areas in the world, all of a sudden, a 25-kilo slickhead pops up. Just to let you know where we are in the whole uh, fish kind of tree, you often hear percomorphs, the bush at the top of the tree is kind of the last thing we need to figure out in fish phylogeny. But it's not really true because uh, there's still many issues. For example, these guys. Some years ago, we worked on the phylogeny using mitogenomic data, and we found out that the slickheads, they're actually in a clade right here, consisting of uh, cupriniforms, that's carp fishes, cariciforms like piranhas, uh, siluriforms, that catfishes, and electric eels, you know, predominantly freshwater fishes. So you have all these, and they're really successful groups. You have thousands and thousands of species in this autocephalan group. And then you have this obscure slickhead uh, group and the herrings somewhere in there. So what is actually uh, correct, we actually have no idea. It all depends on how you analyze data and what data you use. So it's really, it is unresolved. It really is. The only thing we know that this clade is well supported no matter what uh, data you use. But the kind of intra-relationships in that clade, we don't know. It could be it turn out that these are actually some kind of deep-sea herrings. So this is 
as was mentioned earlier, it's, it's, it's an old lineage. Uh, but the phylogeny of these actually show that they've diversified very, very recently. So we have a long, long branch with almost all the species we have used um, diversifying very quickly. So that's the slick heads and tube shoulders. So this uh, particular slick head, I gotta say there was nothing extraordinary strange with it. It kind of reminded of many other slick heads that I work with, uh, except the size. So did some CT scanning and tried to compare it with pretty much anything I get my hands on, but there was really nothing, uh, there was not that much special about it except the size. Here's some CT scanning. CT scanning is just uh, many x-rays put together so you can get a nice 3D view. It's a really useful tool uh, sometimes. And here's just a photo from the paper. You can see this is the py pyloric CK the big mouth. Of course, there are when the, uh, uh, the size of this fish, there are some morphological characters kind of go, go along with, with the size of the fish, but again, there was not that much special about it. Just want to throw in quickly there, it's the otholith, otholith morphology. I've always been fascinated about it, mostly because I don't know much about it, but here you can see the otholith of this. They were so small in this big 25 kilo slick heads, and they look very strange even from the right to the left side, so I don't know if something happened at one point in time. And here you see the one in the mirror bellies I told you about before. This fish is only five centimeters. This one is 140, but the otholiths are so much bigger. So whether it's a kind of a habitat thing that they're mesopelagic, maybe, I don't know, but I think it was, it's just nice to show that otholith morphology being so different. Uh, this was from my Japanese colleagues. They did a trophic position study. Uh, and to see exactly what they were really interested in, in Suruga Bay, they want to see the trophic positions of the main predators. So they compared a whole bunch of sharks and, a little, and uh, different fishes. And it turned out that this new slickhead came out at top with a 4.9 uh, number. Um, they found otholiths in the stomach, so it's a piscivore. Uh, I think it was from an ophidiform. So it definitely has a role, maybe as, as the sharks or something, but it was really surprising because uh, slickheads are usually found to eat zooplankton. The big one I showed you before from Greenland it often has jellyfishes in its stomach. So all of a sudden, and I think it must be the only one out of uh, over 100 species in that family that eats fish. Also very surprising. Oh, there's actually a video here. I wonder if I can get this started. Wait, I did a mistake there. They use baited cameras at a depth of 2,500 meters in Suruga Bay. And there it is. So we were talking about a thing we've never seen before, and all of a sudden they have video, they have, there's four specimens all together. And yeah, on the, as you mentioned, it's from the research vessel Shonan Maru in Suruga Bay. And any of you that work with slickhead species, you'll see that this reminds so much about many other species in the group. Okay. The interesting thing is that during my master's study, we did the phylogeny on the slickheads. And we found, there was, there was, we found many things. There was a lot of uh, incongruence between morphology and uh, molecular data. Actually, most of the genera turned out non-monophyletic. Uh, but one of the more interesting things was that we found a clade, we called it clade A, we didn't really know what to do with it, but it consists of all the deepest living slickheads there are. And sure enough, it checked out this one is in that clade. It's actually, it looks like it's pretty closely related to some other species, but they don't grow more than half a kilo. Um, and also, morphological-wise, very different. They remind more of a, a, a genus like, for example, Aliposephalus than some of these within this clade A, but the molecular data 
confidently put them in this deep sea clay. So definitely waiting. Uh, there might be more new species from this group. It'd be really interesting to see. But it looks like it is a really deep sea clay within the slickheads at this point. So yeah, it makes you wonder what is down there. Uh, just to wrap this up, how many fish species are there in the deep sea habitats? I saw Monty had some numbers this morning. Uh, I, I, I have no idea and I haven't tried to kind of look at it, but I think it is worth mentioning that, for example, if long lining in Suruga Bay catch, uh, catch a new species like that in a place that's been so heavily fished, might be much more. Uh, also in the Erminga Sea, of Greenland, the inaccessible slopes, we haven't been able to fish many places at all. Uh, what, what can we do? We can use environmental DNA, um, but do we want to we wanna diminish like, the diversity to just DNA sequences, you know, even without knowing what is down there? Uh, I don't think, I don't know if that has any worth, but uh, it's an approach we could use, environmental DNA. It's very efficient sometimes. Um, and again, also a place where I think there are a lot of new species is in the mesopelagic zone. For example, this one I showed you. If we don't appreciate this visual ecology, the communication system, which is actually where we, they, they, they speciate, this is where the speciation is going on with some differences, some variation in these communication systems, um, then we really don't know what is the biodiversity. And I think... Uh, I think this mesopelagic zone, we see some of the same things in mctophids. I um, also have some data on it, that these subtle variations that we might use to just think as populational differences and whatnot, it is actually uh, unique uh, communication systems with the photophore patterns, etc. So that's really something we should look into to before, before we just trawl the mesopelagic zone and use it uh, for something completely else. We really should study that zone more, I think so, because there should be much more biodiversity than we know. That's kind of it. I want to just acknowledge fish space. Uh, I've used it so much over the years. Everybody uses it, and the Sweden Museum of Natural History for the invitation, and just some people that I work with over the years has been very inspirational to me. Uh, it's meant a lot. So, thank you. Thank you, Jan. Uh, we have open for questions in this very interesting subject of dwarfs and giants. Anyone from the audience? <coughs> While you are thinking, I'll ask a question then. Because uh, I think it was very interesting with the, with the dwarfs. But I'm not sure I, I got everything. So you had three species. No, five species. Three. Oh, three, sorry. And uh, did you say that one or several of them are deep sea species of eel? Or it was a little bit confusing for me. Then. Okay, I, I need to know which one you are you talking about. The, yeah. The, that one we can see all of them. Yeah. So, so it's five families. Five families, and they are four eels, or they're all eels. Yeah. Or it's just a particular eels. group of deep sea pelagic eels. Yeah. So before there was four families, but we showed those five, and we finally got the larval together for all five of them. And those eels, the size of these eels. Did you mention that? Or? Well, the, the neosaima, the maximum is 16 centimeters. The monognathids, they, it's kind of same size, but they can have some quite peculiar uh, tail arrangements. So it might, they might have a little filament, makes them double as long. They're very strange fishes. They're called one jaws because they reabsorb the upper jaw as adults. They might have a poisonous fang, like snake kind of like thing instead. Uh, but you see the larvae right here, they have two jaws as normal. 
So a peculiar thing, but it's kind of the same size, very small. The Saima, also same size, but these two, the pelican eels, for example, um, and the gulper eels, they, they grow pretty large. Like a meter? Or yeah, I guess, okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and this was the first time you've discovered those deep sea eels? Or? No, no, they've been known. They've been known. All of these were actually known before. It was just the classification that and the larvae that was okay, kind of that was mixed the new around. Thing. Yeah. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Any questions from the audience? Everyone is very sleepy after the lunch. Eh? Uh, so another question then is, um, you have the, um, you talked about the photophores, and can you explain a little bit more how that works and why? The photophores. Yeah. Maybe you, are you think of this. Yeah, this one. Yeah, it's. Um, um, Fanny was talking a lot about uh, the, the kind of visual ecology and mctophis and uh, we're kind of in the same area. So for these different species, they have very unique photophore patterns. So here's one example. This is Holbyrnia macrops. And here's another example right here. So these small variations is how the photophore looks like as adults. That is probably how they recognize each other and find mates, etc. So it's mainly a mating Well, we don't know, to be honest. Uh, that could be counter-illumination, that could be attracting prey, anti predators that could be many things. But when you have a group of fishes that show these photophore patterns so distinct in each species, then you kind of have to assume that it has something to do with communication. But again, no, we never know, of course. Mm. Okay. I have a last question for you, and that is about the giant, the slickheads, uh, amazing animal. Yes. And you said it could be 25 kilos. Wow, that's a big one. It is a big one. And the length? That was uh, 140 centimeters. Okay. And so this one was found uh, between different depths. Or it comes up to well, the surface as well. Well, they caught with the Ave Shonan Mara, they caught uh, four specimens between, I think it's between 2100 and 2500 meters. So, so it's, it's in that range. Yeah. So, so this is uh, either for scientific trolling or it's a bycatch? No, that was long lining. And that was the whole, ah. that was the whole thing. It's just because it was long lined that we actually caught it. These, these areas have been trolled many times. Mm -hmm. But because it's a piscivore, is the only slick head, then all of a sudden you just, and I think it's, it was kind of a testing long lines in this area, uh, in the, it's Jamstek, based in Kanagawa outside Tokyo. They have this huge project, also with the trophic positions of the different uh, species in that area. Uh, so no, it was only because of long lining they actually got it. Oh, very interesting. Uh, uh, they told me I could not mention the name. <laughs> okay, so they are named, but I so asked. hideous. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, last chance. Yeah. Now we have someone in the audience who have a question. Um, the uh, bacteria or uh, um, bioluminescence. Bioluminescence. Um, the bacteria or enzymes. Det varierer meget. Dem, jeg har snakket om... Oh, I'm sorry. Han spurgte på svensk. It varies. So, these ones, and the tube shoulders, it's all uh, enzyme-based, you know, a luciferine, luciferase reaction. We kind of, the enzyme get oxygenized, and then uh, it sends out bioluminescence. I think a group as the anglerfishes, there's, uh, um, there's also a bioluminescence from uh, bacteria involved. Yeah, so it's a little bit different. I think the enzyme systems are the most common, uh, but I think you have to read Edith Witter's work on that if you want to real, uh, yeah, go through a, what is what. But for these, it's enzymes. Yeah. 
And a lot of the taxonomy today is then secured by DNA. Y you can say finalized with DNA. Well, I think uh, Alan Jameson's uh, talk kind of showed how, uh, what the problems they face. I, I, in a group like the snail fish, you can't really get around DNA. Mm -hmm. uh, in these particular cases, it's um, when you have such solid characters in the adults. Mm -hmm. But again, if you then start to want to compare the juveniles as well, for example, in the tube shoulders, where it was impossible to see where the what species the juvenile was, mm -hmm. uh, then you again eventually will need the DNA. So I think it's, yeah, the more DNA, the better, for sure. And then I saw you mentioned, or it was on one of your slides, the environmental DNA, the eDNA. Yeah. How much do you use that in deep sea scientific research? I, not, not much as yet. The problem is that the uh, DNA uh, kind of degenerate or deteriorates quite fast uh, and also in a deep sea environment where you have to assume that many of the species are very rare you can't really count on getting the actually DNA uh, in the environmental sample so uh, for, for basic kind of biodiversity research eDNA has not really uh, done anything yet but I could I could see it, it, it yeah it has potential for sure okay any last question to Jan. Now, then we give him a big hand. Thank you very much. <laughs>